Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Consciousness is genuine, historically authorized, natural, and transcendental because of Bhagavad Gita. Old and young people are particularly interested in the Bhagavad Gita. Srila Prabhupada did not take any credit, credit for the Bhagavad Gita but gave it all to his eternal spiritual master. There is no difference between Krishna's name, form, qualities, pastimes, etc. Lord Chaitanya clearly says that everyone who tries to understand Bhagavad Gita from the Mayavadi point of view will commit a great blunder. Krishna descends to this planet once in a day of Brahma or eight billion six hundred million years. To interpret Bhagavad Gita without any reference to the will of Krishna is the greatest offense. In order to save oneself from this offense, one has to understand the Lord as Supreme Personality of Godhead, as he was directly understood by Arjuna, Lord Krishna's first disciple. People in general, especially in this age of Kali, are enamored by the external energy in Krishna, and they wrongly think that by advancement of material comforts, every man will be happy. A living entity is happily a part and parcel of the Lord, and thus his natural function is to render immediate service to the Lord. Anyone seriously interested in deriving benefit by studying the Bhagavad Gita must take help from the Krishna consciousness movement by for practical understanding of the Bhagavad Gita under the direct guidance of the Lord. Yeah. Very good. Nice summary. Yes. So, Guruji, I covered 15 points. Okay. So, identify major themes or preface in Bhagavad Gita. So, the first one is that our Krishna conscious movement is genuine historically authorized as uh, Prabhupada already covered. Mm -hmm. So Krishna conscious movement is genuine, historically authorized, natural and transcendental because it is based on Bhagavad Gita as it is. So it is not only becoming popular in the entire world among the younger generation but older generation is also taking to it. Then original father of this movement is Krishna himself. Then uh, whatever we are able to do in Krishna consciousness is merely due to the mercy of our spiritual master who is our spiritual guru eternally. Because Prabhupada quotes here, if I have any credit in this connection, it does not belong to me personally, but it is due to my eternal spiritual master. Then Prabhupada version is Bhagavad Gita as it is. 
It presents the mission of Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. Then our business is to present the will of Krishna, not that of any mundane spectator. Then Krishna is absolute, there is no difference between Krishna's name as per what we covered, Krishna's form, qualities and Krishna's pastime. So, ordinary, so to understand this, we need to be devotee of Krishna in the system of disciplic succession. succession. Otherwise, it's very difficult to understand. As Dr. Chaitanya says that Mayavadi, if we try to understand Bhagavad Gita from Mayavadi point of view, it will be a blunder. Then what's the purpose? Purpose of as it is, Bhagavad Gita as it is, is to guide the conditional, conditioned student um, for the same reason why Krishna descended, descends to this planet once in a day of Brahma. And the pur purpose, the real purpose is that we have to accept as it is what the speaker Lord Krishna is saying. So that's the purpose. Then, and we have to understand Lord, by reading Bhagavad Gita reading, if we, our reading is correct or not, that will be determined by it. If we are understanding the Lord as Supreme Personality of Godhead as He was directly understood by Arjuna. So unless we reach that level, it's, uh, we, we, uh, if we reach that level, then it will be very profitable and welfare for the human society. Uh, we will be able to achieve the mission of Krishna Consciousness Movement, which is um, essential for human society. It offers highest perfection of life. Then, uh, this is basically a great science. Then twelfth, a living entity is part and parcel of Lord. So the, new, the natural function is to, to serve Krishna. And this is the this is the real perfection of life. If instead we focus on our sense gratification, so that's not the perfection of life. That's wasting human life mission. Then the central point of Bhagavad Gita is that Lord wants this, and He is demanding it. So we have to understand that the central point of Bhagavad Gita is to attain the highest perfection of life, to become, to render service to Lord. Then fourteenth point is that so basically our Krishna Consciousness Movement is teaching to the whole world this central point and students who are interested in deriving benefit by studying Bhagavad Gita they have to take help of Krishna Consciousness Movement it's a practical understanding of Bhagavad Gita and the guidance should be from directly from under the like under the direct guidance of Lord and then Prabhupada writes in the end the, this is very important if even a one man becomes a pure devotee of Lord. We shall consider our attempt for success. So that's also a major theme here. And I have a question, Prabhuji. Why Prabhupada is writing everywhere our, our. So probably is he writing for him and his Guru and Krishna? Or our means our is gone? Everywhere he's, he's used this word, our Krishna conscious movement. We shall consider our attempt for success. Why he's signing it as... That he's inclusive. So now I want you to look something up on the internet. Uh, at this internet, I did not get it. So I'll try. Yeah. I have the phone. What do you want to do? Okay, Bhakti, the art of love, by Swami Vivekananda. Sorry, Guru, Bhakti. Bhakti, the art of love, by Swami Vivekananda. practical demonstration of why Lord Chaitanya says not to read the books of, written by Mayavadis. Well, yeah, I see the book but it's on Amazon. No, there's a PDF. There's a PDF file. Look up Bhakti, The Art of Love by yes. Vivekananda, the PDF. Mm -hmm. File? Mm -hmm. PDF. In the search yeah, Prabhu, I have volume 6 notes. In the search. What? Because. In the search, you put by type. Okay. So, Prabhu, on Bhakti Yoga? Yeah. yeah Bhakti, the art of love. Yeah? I got a. It's called Bhakti Yoga. I don't. Uh, I didn't find the. By the Vivekananda? Art. Yes. So by Vivekananda? Okay, yeah. let me see. Let me see. Yeah. That's it. Okay. So. 
uh, I'm going to read something that he wrote. Okay, now, Vivekananda is, is a very, very intelligent man. Uh, he's a very good writer. Is this what you're looking at? There are five stages of love. No, no, just one second. Okay, he says, We can come back to it and we'll start in the lesson. Okay, so here we have uh, Vivekananda is a very intelligent person and Okay, so uh, that was the preface. Now, in the preface, the main themes in the entire Bhagavad Gita are discussed. What's that? In the Bhagavad Gita, the main theme—I mean, the, in the preface, the main themes are discussed. But one point you didn't dis you didn't mention, and that is, uh, by the spell of illusion, one tries to be happy by serving his personal sense gratification in different forms which will never make him happy. Instead of satisfying his own personal material senses, he has to satisfy the senses of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of life. The Lord wants this, and he demands it. One has to, has to understand this central point of Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so this is the most important thing in this preface. And Prabhupada picks up this theme yeah, in the first chapter, uh, first chapter, uh, verse number 30, 32 to 35. Let's look at that. Chapter 1, verses 32 to 35. If you attain Krishna consciousness, it's by following this major theme. Page number 52. Page number 52. Page number 52. Chapter 1, text 32 to 35. 
Now I'm going to read this and then we'll compare the two statements. What's in the preface and what's here. He says, uh, in the purport, Prabhupada says, Arjuna has addressed Lord Krishna as Govinda because Krishna is the object of all pleasures for cows and the senses. By using this significant word, Arjuna indicates that Krishna should understand what will satisfy Arjuna's senses. But Govinda is not meant for satisfying our senses. If we try to satisfy the senses of Govinda, however, then automatically our own senses are satisfied. Materially, everyone wants to satisfy his own senses and he wants God to be the order supplier for such satisfaction. The Lord will satisfy the senses of living entities as much as they deserve by their previous karma, but not to the extent that they may covet or desire. But when one takes the opposite way, namely when one tries to satisfy the senses of Govinda without desiring to satisfy one's own senses, then by the grace of Govinda, all desires of living entity are satisfied. Arjuna's deep affection for community and family members is exhibited here partly due to his natural compassion for them. He, theref he is therefore not prepared to fight. Okay, so, in the, in the, what, what I pointed out in the preface as the most important point, and that is the following. A living at uh, so this is at the end of the preface, the, the uh, last paragraph, a few lines from the beginning of that last paragraph. It says, "A living entity is happily the part and parcel of the Lord, and thus his natural function is to render immediate service to the Lord. By the spell of illusion, one tries to be happy by serving his personal sense gratification in different forms." which will never make him happy. Instead of satisfying his own personal, mater personal material senses, he has to satisfy the senses of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of life. The Lord wants this, and he demands it. One has to understand this central point of Bhagavad Gita. Our Krishna Consciousness Movement is teaching the whole world this central point. So. That central point is explained in the verse, first chapter, text 32 to 35, in the purport, where it says, Arjuna's mistake was he, he's addressing Krishna as Govinda, but he's thinking that Govinda means that he supplies pleasure to the senses of the living entities and to the cows. And it says here, by using this significant word, meaning Govinda, Arjuna indicates that Krishna should understand what will satisfy Arjuna's senses. And Prabhupada says, but Govinda is not meant for satisfying our senses. If we try to satisfy the senses of Govinda, however, then automatically our own senses are satisfied. So that's the... That's the purpose of deity worship, to reorient the way we think and act from being selfishly self-indulgent to being unselfishly uh, dedicated to pleasing Krishna, pleasing Krishna's senses. Therefore, we offer incense, we offer food, we offer nice clothes, uh, we dance for the Lord, all this is to please the senses of the Lord. So Arjuna had this fundamental misunderstanding. He thought that Govinda meant that Krishna is supposed to satisfy our senses. You see. And if you look at the modern practice of Hinduism, that same mis misconception is there. People think God is the order supplier for our sense gratification. We need something, we go and pray for it, or we have a puja done for our, for our benefit. Like when you invite some Brahmin, some pundit to your house uh, for Satya Narayana puja, in the beginning he makes you repeat 
the word mama. What does mama mean? No, for me. So is that the purpose of doing a sacrifice for Krishna? You see. So uh, if you look in the Bhagavad Gita, 18th chapter, verse number 6, Prabhupada clearly says, Eighteenth chapter, verse number six. First one, verse number five, eighteen five. He says, "Acts of sacrifice, charity, and penance are not to be given up." Who knows the difference between the meaning of sacrifice and the meaning of penance? Anybody know? Do you penance think they mean the same tapas, thing? Yeah. What? Tapas. I mean. Oh. To achieve, uh, uh, like whatever they want, they do the Oscar tea. Yes. And sacrifices, that's right. Sacrifices, uh, basically sacrificing, like giving up something, tiaga. Yes, and what is penance? Penance is uh, austerity, that's what it is. But if, if you want something uh, to achieve that one, um, you do like, uh, you leave everything, whatever, I mean, whatever you like, you leave everything behind. So there is an expectation and there is a non-expectation of giving. So no, penance is like we follow some, some spiritual practice for the benefit, like we get up in the morning. <coughs> when you say that, no, people don't understand the difference between the two. Penance means meditate. Meditation to reach no, no, no. God. Rashi I think sacrifice is that you are giving up something, but without yeah. any expectation. No, I don't understand. Penance means to hear and because it would did it damn right. I mean, Prahlad's father has that is not the penance. No, he is not penance. Okay. Rui, what is voluntary? Where another is forceful. No. Penance is tapa and spiritual thing is tiaga. Tapa means like doing some spiritual practice. Tapa is the same as Tiaga. No. Okay. Well, you're correct about sacrifice. Sacrifice, you sacrifice something you have for the pleasure of the Lord. Right? But penance means you committed some sin. Oh, prashita. Prashita. Yeah, prashita. Yeah, yeah, you've committed some sin and you're willing to undergo, uh, you know, personal let's say, discomfort to make up for the sin. So penance is specifically because one has committed some sin, they receive some uh, reformatory activity, like they have to chant more or they have to uh, do th different types of uh, uh, purificatory things. Whereas sacrifice, you sacrifice something you have, oftentimes something you're attached to, like money or whatever, uh, to serve the Lord. Okay? So here he says, acts of sacrifice, charity, and penance are not to be given up. They must be performed. Indeed, sacrifice, charity, and penance purify even the great souls. Now, the next verse is the key verse. It says, All these activities, meaning sacrifice, charity, and penance, should be performed without attachment or any expectation of result. They should be performed as a matter of duty. O Sana Prita, that is my final opinion. Now, in the purport, Prabhupada makes uh, a lot of uh, important statements. He says, Although all sacrifices are purifying, one should not expect any result from such performances. In other words, all sacrifices which are meant for material advancement in life should be given up. But sacrifices that purify one's existence and elevate one to the spiritual plane should not be stopped. Everything that leads to Krishna consciousness must be encouraged. 
in the Srimad Bhagavatam also is said that any activity which leads to devotional service to the Lord should be accepted. That is the highest criterion of religion. A devotee of the Lord should accept any kind of work, sacrifice, or charity which will help him in the discharge of devotional service to the Lord. So you sacrifice, you give something up, you offer it to the Lord, but the whole idea is to be able to advance spiritually. Any sacrifice meant for material advancement should be given up. So if you invite some pundit to your house, to do Satyanaya and Puja. And he said, in the beginning, he says, now repeat after me, Mama. You know right there, first of all, he doesn't know anything about Bhagavad Gita or Krishna consciousness. And number two, he's misleading you to violate Krishna's instructions. Have you ever had uh, a priest come to your house and do Satyana Puja? Did he ask you to say Mama? <laughs> Mama doesn't mean your mother, right? Mama means <laughs> for me. <laughs> so here Prabhupada says that by the spell of illusion, one tries to be happy. This is in the preface near the end. By the spell of illusion, one tries to be happy by serving his personal sense gratification in different forms, which will never make him happy. So, first of all, he's making a big statement here. As long as we're trying to be happy by serving our personal sense gratification in all the different forms, we will never be happy by doing that. Then he says, instead of satisfying his own personal material senses, he has to satisfy the senses of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of life. The Lord wants this, and He demands it. Not only He wants it, He demands it. One has to understand the central point of Bhagavad Gita. Well, what did He demand of Arjuna? He demanded that He fight. Arjuna did not want to fight. He wanted to walk away. So Prabhu, this demand part, is it like the 18.6, is, that is where it comes like demanding you must to sacrifice um, charity and penance? Well, uh, charity, penance, all these things are only good if there's no expectation of material gain. Right. Uh, like, for example, if you're thinking, well, if I give $10 to Krishna, he'll give me back $100. My business will do better, and this thing will do it. Have you ever heard any gurus advertise, you give me one, I give you back 10 <laughs> You can't even get that in the bank, right? That's better than <laughs> putting your money in the bank. But all these things are cheating. It's all cheating. And you know that anyone who's, who's advertising like that is the number one cheater and doesn't know anything about Bhagavad Gita or Krishna. Zero. So then in the first chapter, 32nd and 35th verse, uh, Prabhupada points out that Arjuna had a complete misconception about Krishna as Govinda. He thought Govinda means that he'll supply the sense gratification for Arjuna. But Govinda doesn't mean that. But what does Govinda mean? The real definition of Govinda is, is the object of uh, pleasure for all the senses. So, there's a difference between he supplies pleasure to your senses and the real definition, which is he's the object of pleasure for the senses. In other words, when you see Krishna, you're totally satisfied. So, Arjuna asks to see the universal form of Krishna and he gets bewildered. 
And then he asked Krishna to show his Narayana form. But then he says, but please show me your original form, uh, two-handed form. So when he's talking about the two-handed form of Krishna, he, he describes it in a very particular way. Uh, and he says, Dristvedam manusam rupam tava somyam janardana, 11th chapter, 51st verse. When Arjuna thus saw Krishna in his original form, he said, O Janardhan, seeing this human-like form so very beautiful, I am now composed in mind. Meaning, my, now my mind is peaceful. And I am restored to my original nature. So, Arjuna describes Krishna's form as Manusam Rupam Somyam. Now, Somyam I'm sure you have the same name in Hindi, same word in Hindi, right? What does it mean? Somyam very beautiful? Very soft. Very soft. Well, in Sanskrit, it's very, very beautiful. Exquisitely beautiful, right? So, when Arjuna sees the form of Krishna in his two-armed form, he said, now my mind is peaceful. peaceful. Now I'm, I'm very satisfied. So that's the real meaning of the word Govinda, it means, meaning that he's the the real object of pleasure for the senses. Okay. Now, so he says, so Arjuna's misconception was he was thinking that Govinda means he'll please Arjuna's senses. But Prabhupada says, but Go Govinda is not meant for satisfying our senses. Now, is there a difference between the meaning of Govinda is the object of pleasure for, for all the senses, or Govinda is meant to please our senses. Is there a difference in meaning between those two statements? It, and on the surface, it sounds as if they might mean the same thing. So, when uh, the purpose of our life is to please our own senses. We become eventually depressed. Right? Now, the best example of that is Marilyn Monroe, if you ever heard of her. She was uh, a very exceptionally beautiful woman, and uh, she had everything you can imagine. Wealth, fame, Everything you can imagine. She committed suicide when she was 30, I think 33 or 34 years old. Now, she had all the sense gratification you could imagine. But yet she committed suicide when she was young and beautiful. Right. So you see, what Prabhupada is saying here is true. That, uh, he says, again in the preface, he says, under, by the spell of illusion, one tries to be happy by serving his personal sense gratification in different forms, which will never make him happy. So Marilyn Monroe tried everything uh, to uh, please her senses, but it never made her happy. And the proof is, in a young age, she committed suicide. Then he says, instead of satisfying his own personal material senses, he has to satisfy the senses of Krishna. That is the highest perfection of life. And then also he says, but Govinda is not meant for satisfying our senses. If we try to, try to satisfy the senses of Govinda, however, then automatically our own senses are satisfied. So if we try and please Krishna's senses, we will be satisfied. It's like watering the root of a tree instead of watering every leaf of the tree. You water the root of the tree, all the leaves are satisfied. You try and water each leaf, the tree might die. So if, rather than trying to please our own senses, if we use our senses to please Krishna's senses, we will also be happy. Because we're part and parcel of Krishna. If Krishna is happy, we'll be happy. 
That is the highest perfection of life. The Lord wants this, and he demands it. One has to understand the central point of Bhagavad Gita. Our Krishna conscious movement is teaching the whole world the central point. And because we are not polluting the theme of Bhagavad Gita as it is, anyone seriously interested in deriving benefit by studying Bhagavad Gita must take help from the Krishna conscious movement for practical understanding of Bhagavad Gita under the direct guidance of the Lord. So here we have the central point of the Bhagavad Gita. And it's a decision that we have to make every day. Should I work for my own sense gratification or should I work for Krishna's sense gratification? And most people cannot do it. They cannot do it. It's so corrupted by the association in the material world that uh, and then this you know like for example uh, whenever I fly they have the shiny magazines you know like United or Delta <coughs> they have a very shiny magazine you know. so one time I was looking at the magazine and the front cover said go to Montreal and be happy so I looked and there was a whole you know like seven eight ten pages about Montreal all shiny color print and it shows, you know, some museum, and it shows some architecture building, it shows a bar, it shows a casino, it shows, you know, different things, right? And everywhere people are, you know, very uh, beautiful and shiny and happy and like that. And so one time uh, there was a sannyasi giving a lecture and he said when he was in New York waiting to fly to Paris, he saw a sign, advertisement in New York airport, said, go to Paris and be happy. <laughs> so, when he arrived in Paris, he was walking through the airport and he saw a big sign, go to New York and be happy. <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> uh, this is all the false propaganda, you know. Go back to Godhead and be happy, right? Go to Krishna and be happy. But no, no, go here, go there. People think, I'll be happy there. I'm not happy here. If you're not happy here, how are you going to have be happy there? You see. So, uh, when we, like Arjuna, we see, manasam rupam tava somyam janardana. When we see the human-like form of Krishna, that's extremely beautiful. I mean, he has two arms like that. It's extreme, more beautiful even than Narayana, although Narayana is extremely beautiful, right? But Krishna is probably even more beautiful than Narayana. And the proof is Arjuna actually has the experience. It's not theoretical. He actually saw the universal form. He didn't want to see it because it, it was frightening. Then he sees Lord Narayana, and, it, it's, and he's very happy to see Lord Narayana. But he wanted to see... Krishna's manasam rupam somyam, the most beautiful form. And then he was completely peaceful. So, here's a person who actually was with Krishna, who actually saw Narayana, but he, he chose to... His greatest pleasure was seeing Krishna's transcendental form. Although there's no difference between Krishna and Narayana, it's the same person. Just like... When you're, uh, let's say, working in your garden and you get a little dirty and you have some old pants on and everything, people see you. But then they see you with a tuxedo on, nice haircut and, you know, all shiny and jewelry and things, you know. So it doesn't look the same, right? Uh, so in the same way, Krishna's personal form is the most beautiful form, unparalleled. Even Narayana doesn't come close to it. Although Narayana is also the Supreme Personality of God, it's also Krishna, but Krishna's personal form is super excellent. And just like when you're in a tuxedo and uh, all dressed up, decked out, everything, with cufflinks and your ring and your gold chain and everything, people see you, you know, they say, oh, what a gentleman. But then when they see you working in the garden, you know, it's not the same thing. 
But it's the same, the same you. Right. But not the same thing. <clears throat> okay, so now we know what the central theme or the central point of the Bhagavad Gita is. Now, can we make that adjustment in our personal lives? That is the fundamental question. If we can make that adjustment. And, uh, and I know uh, personally, uh, whenever you try and please your own senses, uh, afterwards you realize that you're not completely satisfied. So you have to try again. And you have to try different things. Uh, but ultimately, you get defeated because you get old and sick. Just like there was a picture of a husband and wife, they were married 62 years. So there's a picture of them in the 1940s when they got married. They were all young and happy and hugging each other. And, everything. and then there's a picture, they both died minutes apart in the nursing home. And when you see them, they're very sick, and the wife died first, and they were holding hands when they died. Right? But they look like skeletons. Right? So they show you both pictures. When they were young, they just got married, they're bright faced, they look so happy and handsome, and the wife was beautiful, right? And then they show you the last minute, they were holding hands in the nursing home. You know, both are in bed, and the wife has, you know, tubes in her nose and all over, and the husband also. And she dies first, and about a few minutes later, her husband died, after 62 years of marriage. So. Now, you can see that their whole life, they were dedicated to each other, right? But, it's not a pretty sight. It's not a pretty sight at all. I mean, if you see, I mean, it's in the news. It was in the news yesterday. But that's not the first time. There are other couples. There was one couple who was married 68 years. They died together, just minutes apart. Again, holding hands in the nursing home. This is a new, new standard here in America. <laughs> so, uh, you never really are satisfied. Say, I mean, how many years are you going to hold hands with your husband or your wife, right? Uh, and what are they thinking about when they're dying? They're thinking about each other. That means they take birth again. As a husband and wife, as birds or dogs or cats or something, right? So uh, that's not the purpose of life. purpose of life is if we practice Krishna consciousness, we will make this adjustment. And we will actually experience that we get full satisfaction by using our senses and our energy to please Krishna. Then we get full satisfaction. And at the end of life, we'll be able to think of Krishna and go back to Godhead. And whoever uh, we have a relationship with, the family relationship, personal relationship, those persons are also benefited to go back to God. So then we have to think, what is the best way I can live and do the greatest good? Not only for myself, but for <coughs> others. It's to make this adjustment. Instead of, instead of satisfying one's own personal material senses, one can satisfy the senses of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of life. Okay, so now we can get into the introduction. So before you go to the introduction, you, know, you go back to Godhead, you said about it. Recently, you know, one family came from India, then he passed away here. Yeah. What is the connection? Because, you know, he doesn't have, he, he doesn't have any idea about Krishna and Krishna consciousness. Huh? And before he passed away, prior to three days before, always listening Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And before he dies, like, you know, reading the Bhagavad Gita chapters, nourishing their prayers. In the past life, I mean, what is the connection? The Lord arranged, he sent his troop before he... No, wait a minute. Okay, the question to ask is... I don't know how to ask the question. The question no, the question to ask is... Mike, I'm asking a question. Uh, 
his family members here in Seattle, uh, were they Krishna conscious? No. His family members here in Krishna? No. Obviously they were because how could he die hearing Bhagavad Gita, hearing chanting? Not exactly his family, his cousin. Yeah, okay, well they're family also. So they arranged for him to hear Hare Krishna? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that that's what you have to explain. You're, you're saying, uh, how is it that he this happened to him? It happened to him because he came in contact with devotees. That's why it happened. It just so happened that uh, he had a, a, a health crisis and he was going to die very quickly. But he was fortunate enough to be in the company of devotees. So then, then we come back to the same question. How can I do the most good in my life, not only to myself, but to others? Can I do that by having four billion dollars in the bank when I die? No. No. I mean, you can't take that money with you. It's not going to save you at the moment of death. Right? But what if I spent the four billion dollars to promote Krishna consciousness all over the world before I died? Ah, that's different. You see. So, and, and we shouldn't try and spend it at the last minute. We should be doing it all along. By the way, the more you give to Krishna, the more Krishna gives you to give. That's a rule. That's a, actually, it's a fact. The more you give, the more Krishna gives you to give. The less you give, the less Krishna gives you to give. So we should never be... Yeah. So he left, a, he left a, on that content topic, that topic. So he left his body by listening to Bhagavad Gita Prabhu. So yeah. did he go back to Scotland? That's what I thought about. Or, uh, no, uh, well, let's put it like this. You'll have a chance to be a human being next life. And start from the point where you left off, hearing Bhagavad Gita. Oh, okay. So he'll be born as a devotee. Well, he'll be born, let's say, near devotees. Near devotees. To begin from the point he left off. So, you're never a loser in Krishna consciousness. Because even 1% of devotion, like say, you hearing Bhagavad Gita, even though all your life you didn't hear Bhagavad Gita, but the last minute you heard Bhagavad Gita, you get a chance in the next life to start from the point you left off. Yeah. 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 Sorry, it's a little bit different from the lake. So we are talking about the like dying. So like in India, we grow up like that. means the woman died before husband. She get about it. So she get what? She get like close to go back closer to Krishna or whatever. It's like woman should go before the like, yeah, even my husband. husband. Like a woman. Wife should die before husband. Okay. So it's why it's called Swagana. See, this is, this is this is a paternalistic society. The <laughs> wife has to die before the husband. Yeah. Okay. So it's good. And if she doesn't, she goes It's like she's like, made to die, then that's Sati Pratha. No, then she like. commits Sati. Yeah. yeah. No, not even commit Sati. Even still, <laughs> people think. Even I think, okay, I want to go before my husband. I want yeah. to die. Okay. So I just want to know this Prabhu. Like me and my Prabhu, we are trying to practice Krishna consciousness. So, is there any scripture mentioned that I die before him, so I get some advantage? Well, I, <laughs> I, I'll tell you a funny story. I'll tell you, a funny story. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Lakshmi, the lady that makes the flower garlands and, and yeah. flower vases. Yeah. yeah. So this a couple of years ago. She, I was talking to her. and said, "My husband just bought me five million dollars of life insurance." I said, really? I said, that's impressive. I said, what do you mean that's impressive? It's dangerous. <laughs> I said, what do you mean dangerous? He's going to kill me to get that money. <laughs> well, you know, let's... You know, the, the real wisdom in life is you have to die to live. Now, that doesn't make sense for most people. But for devotees, it makes sense. Die to live means... You should die in the process of 
in, in the attempt for material sense gratification in order to live spiritually in this lifetime. So here it's saying, instead of satisfying his own personal material senses, he has to satisfy his senses of the Lord. That's dying to live. Most people are living to satisfy their own senses. But if you stop trying to satisfy your own senses, most people think you're dead. Like, for example, someone was telling me, uh, Prabhuji, you know, ever since I've become Krishna conscious, even my own family doesn't like me anymore. I said, why? Said, well, they say, oh, you don't eat like us anymore, and you don't come... Uh, we don't go out to the movies anymore, we don't go out to the parties, we don't go to the casino. You know, you're like dead. <laughs> so, that person, in the eyes of the others, is dead already, because they're not doing anything that they normally do for pleasure. Right? So, I, I had an uncle once, and uh, he was a World War II veteran, he was a sharpshooter. An American, uh, he was a uh, uh, army ranger. I mean, he was a he was an elite soldier in, in World War II in uh, in Europe, and uh, and he was, you know, he saw a lot of terrible combat in World War II, and he he himself killed a lot of people. So he was a very tough guy. So one day I visited them after I was a devotee, and. Uh, they were asking me, you know, what kind of life you had. You know, I was dressed as a devotee. So what kind of life you had, you know. And he, he didn't believe in God. Because, you know, he saw so much atrocities during the war. They just didn't believe in religion anymore. So when I told him, you know, I don't eat meat, I don't gamble, I don't do this, I don't do that. He said, I'm going to tell you a story now. I said, okay. He said, one time a question was asked, who is the most foolish person in the world? And he said, and our grandfathers and great-grandfathers, they discussed this point. And they finally arrived at the conclusion that the most foolish person in the world is that person who doesn't drink doesn't smoke, doesn't eat meat, and doesn't chase after women. He said, that's the most foolish person in the world. And he looked me right in the eye when he said it. Right? I mean, he was, he was like purposely uh, doing it. And I looked at him and smiled. I said, well, I said, Uncle G, I said, you got it all wrong. If you believe that, that means you're a bigger fool than I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> he stopped talking to me after that. <laughs> but see, this is the point that that uh, people can't make this adjustment because they're so conditioned to working only for their own selfish pleasure. They can't imagine working selflessly to please the Lord. And because of that, they're frustrated. Always frustrated. Only a devotee can bring real let's say, benefit to people. Because if the devotee is happy working f uh, for Krishna, then they say, well, wait a minute. The goal of life is to be happy. And you seem to be very happy. And we're working to be happy, but we're not that happy. Maybe you know something better than we do. You see. But, it, but if you're chanting Hare Krishna and you're not happy, then it's impossible to convince another person to chant Hare Krishna. They say, wait a minute, if you're not happy and you want me to chant Hare Krishna, then that means, you know, I'll end up like you. So why should I chant Hare Krishna? I want to be happy. Everybody wants to be happy, right? So why, how could they believe that by chanting Hare Krishna they'll be happy if you're not happy and you're chanting Hare Krishna? So to be a genuine, and see, most people think, oh, you know, when I was young, I joined Hare Krishna, and I gave up all the pleasures of life, and now I'm older, and I think I made a mistake. 
Well, that's the worst thing, right? And there are people like that. They think, well, when I was younger, I was chanting Hare Krishna, and doing all these things, waking up early, and now I'm older, and I, you know, I only make, you know, $40,000 a year, and I'm working really hard, and, and I'm not happy. So, they never were Krishna conscious. That's the whole point. If you're actually Krishna conscious, then, uh, as Krishna tells Arjuna, Raja Vidya Raja Guyam Pavitam Idam Uttamam Patyaksha Bhagavan Dharmam Susakam Kartam Abhyam. Let's take a look at that ninth chapter. Second verse. And it says, This knowledge of Bhagavad Gita is the king of education. Raja Vidya. The most secret of all secrets. Raja Guyam. It is the purest knowledge. Pavitram. And because it gives direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of religion. Pavitram idam uttamam. Pratyaksha vagamam dharmam. Pratyaksha vagamam dharmam means that it gives direct perception of, uh, of the self by, by realization, and it's the perfection of religion. It is everlasting. And it is joyfully performed. So if you're actually engaged in Krishna consciousness, you will be joyful. And if you say, well, I'm not joyful, although I'm, I'm practicing Krishna consciousness, that means you're practicing at the same time making aparads. That's why you're not joyful. So now we have a criterion to understand if someone is actually practicing Krishna consciousness or not. If they are joyful all the time, they're practicing Krishna consciousness. And if they're not joyful, then they're cheating. They say they're practicing, but they're committing many aparads, many offenses. There's Nama aparad, Dhamma aparad, Vaishnava aparad. You know, uh, offenses against the holy name, offenses against the holy Dhamma, the, a holy place and offenses against other Vaishnavas or even people in general. Okay, so now we have two major criterions here. One, the central point of Bhagavad Gita is to please Krishna. That's the highest perfection. And Krishna has senses, so therefore we offer incense, so it has a nice smell for Krishna. We offer flowers, so you know, he sees nice things. And we offer nice food, so he can taste the food, the love in the food with which we make it and offer it. And we sing nicely so he can hear, right? And, uh, and we massage his body. You know, the, 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 every morning, the pujaris massage Krishna's body, bathe him and massage him, right? And then we, from that water, from that bathe, bathing, we take some water, we make charnamrita. So, Charnamrita is the foot wash of Krishna. So therefore, when we use our senses to please Krishna's senses, that's the highest perfection, and the central, highest perfection of life, and the central point of the Bhagavad Gita. And the second thing is, the proof that we're actually Krishna conscious is that we're always joyful. And if we're practicing Krishna consciousness and we're not joyful, that's proof that we're committing aparats, offenses against the holy name or, or uh, Vaishnavas, etc. Okay, so keep those two main points in mind as we read throughout. <coughs> so now is the introduction. Om Aganyati Mirandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chaksuri Nivitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishnam Shapitam Yena Bhutavi Swayam Rupa Kadabayam Dadati Swatantikam Okay, uh, what would you read? Yeah, go ahead, read out loud. Like the, here? Yeah. I was born in the darkest ignorance, and my spiritual master opened my eyes 
with the torch of knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisances unto him. When will Srila when will Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada, who has established within this material world the mission to fulfill the desire for Chaitanya, give me shelter and his will to speak? Very good. So these two prayers are extremely important. The first prayer is the most important because it indicates the way we should see ourselves in order to begin spiritual life. We should see ourselves as being born in the darkest ignorance. So what is the darkest ignorance? That is, uh, being born in a family that is not Krishna conscious. They might be pious, but not Krishna conscious. And, they, and they're very lax about diet, about uh, even going to the temple. They, they think going to the temple means you walk in the temple, you say a prayer, please God help me make more money, and then they go out. Never listen to any class. Never have the association of genuine sadhus. It's just a customary thing to go to the temple, <coughs> leave some donation, ask for something in return, and then leave. <clears throat> so, uh, there's a difference between being pious and being Krishna conscious. Just like, you know, if you know someone and your relationship with that person is hello, goodbye, right? Hello, how are you? Goodbye. Right. So, is that really a relationship of friendship? Not really. You know, I mean, there's something there, but, you know, uh, hello, goodbye, that's it. And then there's, there's another friend that, you know, you spend a lot of time with them and you really bond and you learn things and you share things. And so that's, that's more of a friendship, right? So sim simply being a dandavat devotee. Dandavat devotee means you walk in the temple, you give your obeisances to the Lord, you say something, and then you walk out. Never listen to any class. Never do any service, uh, even though you give some donation, but it's just a formality, right? Just like, you know, you, every, every year you have to go and get your, uh, your uh, uh, emissions test, right? So you go in, you get $15, you sit down 10 minutes, then they give you this piece of paper, you go out every year or every two years, right? Is there any relationship there? No, it's just a formality, right? Or you have to, uh, you know, pay your taxes. So you fill out the taxes, make a check out, you send it in. Is there any relationship? No, in fact, it's forced. You know, but there's no, no joy in it, right? So we have to understand that we were born in the darkest ignorance. Ignorance means total forgetfulness of Krishna. Just like when you sleep, you're in the mode of ignorance. <coughs> do, you, do you dream of Krishna every night when you go to sleep? No. No, no you don't. Sometimes people say, oh, I dream of him all the time. Yeah. If you ask them to describe the dreams, it sounds like they went to Disneyland or something. You know? it's, it's a silly, some silly dream. So, uh, we have to have a realistic assessment of ourselves and our situation in life in order to begin spiritual life. If we think, oh, I have so much education, I have such a good job, and I have a nice house, and I have 401k, and a nice family, and a nice future, and everything's all right, TK, TK, <coughs> then you're not going to be really interested in the spiritual life. Because you think, you know, I got it all under control. Right? <laughs> but if you feel as if I was born in the darkest ignorance, but when I met 
bona fide guru. He opened my eyes with the torch of knowledge. What is the torch of knowledge? Instead of satisfying my own senses, I should use my senses to satisfy Krishna's senses. That's knowledge. Right? That opens up the door that, you know, people like to go to, you know, Vaikuntha Ekadasi. Right? Because you have the doors of Vaikuntha, right? And you're able to walk in, you know, have darshan. Well, <laughs> this... This realization that instead of working for my own sense gratification, I should work for the sense gratification of Krishna, that's the door to Vaikuntha, that understanding and then that lifestyle. That is the actual door to Vaikuntha. It's not they put up some door, you know, and they open it up and you walk in and you put some donation there and you see Balaji or something. That doesn't mean anything. It means something, but it's, it's not any major thing because as soon as you walk out of the temple you're back into the same mindset as before working for yourself okay let's go to Walmart now or let's go to Costco and buy something so uh, if you have a realization actually I was born in the darkest ignorance I don't really know what the purpose of life is I don't know how to achieve it I don't know what's going to happen to me there's a famous saying uh, in my language, it says, I don't know where I came from. I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know anything. Well, that would sum up most people's lives. They don't know where they came from. They don't know where they are. They don't know where they're going. And they don't, what, they don't know what's going to happen to them. That's, that's the reality. So that's called the darkness of ignorance. So if we're fortunate enough to re meet a genuine guru, then, as they say in English, our eyes open up with the torch of knowledge. Right? Okay, and then it's mentioning Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. Uh, he established within this material world a mission to fulfill the desire of Lord Chaitanya and give me shelter under his lotus feet. So what is that mission? That's, that's Krishna consciousness. Lord Chaitanya spent a whole week explaining Krishna consciousness to Rupa Goswami in Prayag. After that, he wrote the Nectar of Devotion, which explains, it's, the, it's called the Law Book of Krishna Consciousness. So, or you could say it's the Constitution of Krishna Consciousness. What is a Constitution? It's the set of laws on which a country functions. So there's a constitution in the United States that's a set, it, it, it outlines the set of laws by which this country functions. Right. And it delineates, you know, limited powers to the three different sections of government. You know, you have the Congress, you have the judicial, and then you have the presidency. So, the nectar of devotion is the law book of Krishna consciousness, the constitution of Krishna consciousness. It, it, it explains the, the, all the rules and regulations by which a person can become perfect in this lifetime. And that was due to Rupa Goswami. <clears throat> okay, so then the next prayer. Okay, Gus, you can read the next prayer. What time is it now? Okay, we'll stop in a few minutes. Go ahead. The next prayer? Yeah, I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Lord's feet. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Lord, Lord's feet of my spiritual master and unto the feet of all nations. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Lotus Feet of Srila Rupa Goswami, along with his elder brother Sanatana Goswami, as well as Raghunatha Dasa and Raghunatha Bhatta, Bhatta, Gopala Bhatta, and Sri Jiva Goswami. I offer my respectful obeisances to Lord Krishna Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, along with Advaita Acharya Gadadara, Sri Vasa, and other associates. I offer my respectful obeisances unto Srimati Radharani and Sri Krishna, along with their associates, 
Okay, so this is a very important prayer. This is explaining basically the parampara, uh, the uh, the spiritual lineage of uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Okay, next one. Oh, my dear Krishna. Oh, my dear Krishna, you are the friend of the distressed and the source of creation. You are the master of the gopis and the lover of Radharani. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Next. I offer my respect to Radharani, whose godly complexion is like molten gold and who is the queen of Vrindavana. You are the daughter of King Vrishabhanu and you are very dear to Lord Krishna. Next. I offer my respectful obeisances unto all the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord. They can fulfill the desires of everyone, just like desire trees, and they are full of compassion for the fallen souls. Yes. I offer my obeisances to Sri Krishna Sri Anya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara, Sri Vasa, and all others in the line of devotion. Okay. So these prayers are very important to say and remember. And then the next one, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Everything, all knowledge is included in the Maha Mantra Hare Krishna. You might not realize it right now, but it's the key to opening up the entire spiritual world. <clears throat> Because everything is included in that one mantra. Krishna is there, Radharani is there, and Radharani is mercy. So that is the sum and substance of all spiritual life. <clears throat> okay, so uh, homework for next week is to read pages 3 to page... and outline the main themes discussed. So you have 3 to 12. That is what? Nine pages. For introduction. Yeah, an introduction. Page 12 to 12. Well, anyway, from the end of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra to page 12. Right? I, think it's, I think it's the same pages. I'm not sure. So, what's the last line, Prabhuji? What is this Page 12. What is this consciousness before that? Paragraph? 3 to 12. Paragraph starting paragraph 20. Bhagavad Gita is also known as Gita Upanishad. No, the end paragraph, last paragraph. End paragraph should be... Consci material. Consciousness is already there, but we are part and parcel of the Lord. But for us, there is the affinity of being affected by the inferior mode. But the Lord being the Supreme is never affected. That is the difference between a Supreme Lord and all small individual. Okay, which which edition do you have? That's the question. You have the yellow book? Yeah. I have the brown and the red edition. Okay, well that's the same as the one I have. And which one, what we version have, do you have? We have that one. So it's page 12 in that one. So in the yellow book, it's page 11. Bro, what's the, what's the line again? Just the first three, four words? On the last, the last page? It's, uh, but for the Lord being the Supreme is never affected. That is the difference between the Supreme Lord and the small individual soul. What, what, what is this consciousness? Is it before that? Yeah, so, okay, that's yeah, that's right. on page 11, right? Yes. yes. Oh, what is this consciousness? Is the Just the last uh, line. Yeah, yeah, yeah before that paragraph. Right. Every, the paragraph before, before that. that. Yeah, that's what we that's, have. That's it. Yeah. But I don't know. The paragraph starts with when we are particularly no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 The yeah. end of that paragraph, right to the end of that paragraph. Oh. Sorry, the first slide of the paragraph. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? If not, then we will. So, 
as a as a summary, you should write down the two major points that we learned from the preface. Right? We discussed it about ten times today. Point one is that instead of serving our own sense gratification, we should serve the sense gratification of the Lord. And number two is that if you're not happy, you're not. Uh, if you're not happy, then you're not Krishna conscious, even though you're chanting or whatever, right? Yeah, because you must be committing offenses. Okay. If you keep those two points in mind, you'll be able to understand the whole Bhagavad Gita. Haribo. I have a question for you. Yes. Rokhava Swami wrote Chaitanya Charitamrita when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is there. Krishna does. Oh. Rupa Goswami wrote the Nectar of Devotion. Okay, okay. No, today I saw somewhere Chaitanya, uh, they found original Chaitanya Charitamrita near the temple of Loi Bazar. That is for, according to that uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, they, they are telling it's 400 years old. So Mahaprabhu appeared 400 years before or 500 years before? What difference does it make? It doesn't matter. Uh, will will, 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 will no. it change your world view? If, if no, no, no. It's, it came in the dan, dan tabak, 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 tabak. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, but what difference does it we have? We have it here. Yes. So. It was written much later. After, much later. Much later. That's what I want. It was a rendition later in the world. One time uh, in Japan, many, many years ago, one Japanese new person asked Prabhupada a question. Huh? He said, uh, do you talk with the demigods? And Prabhupada looked at him and said, what difference does it make? <laughs> he said to you, if I say yes or if I say no, does it make any difference? See, certain things like that don't they have no meaning. Right? What's important is right now paying attention to what we're discussing, you know, and and assimilating this. We have the nectar of devotion. We have Bhagavad Gita. We have Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada went through so much trouble to give these things to us. Now let us take full benefit of this because these are the most precious scriptures in the whole universe, mm -hmm. not just the earth, the whole universe. And the fact that we have a chance to read this and understand it and practice it means that we're most fortunate. Most fortunate. That's the first realization we have when you read Nectar of Devotion, yeah. that, you know, this is just out of the world. And there can't be any other scripture like this. Yeah. Don't remember what Bhakti Chiru told, Maharaj told us last week. The first book he read was, Bhakti was the Nectar of Devotion and convinced him to become a devotee. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you.